since the beginning of this year, uh, you would have received from us a bunch of invites uh, for different calendar th themes throughout the year. Of course, this doesn't mean that this is the last webinar that MetLife will be running. We are also excited and looking forward to having a similar uh, webinar uh, series for 2022. So uh, please uh, expect to see from us our upcoming invites shortly. Uh, some housekeeping before we start, uh, this session will be around 45 minutes and we will leave 15 minutes at the end for Q&As. Uh, we will first start by uh, Dr. Amna will be presenting a few slides for us. And then afterwards, um, for any questions, please drop them in the chat box or in the Q&A section. If you're using your desktop, you will find the chat function on, the, on your right hand side. If you're using your phone, you will be able to uh, find the chat function at the bottom sector of your screen. Uh, so please feel free to shoot your questions. Just make sure that whenever you send any questions in the chat, to send them to all panelists and not just Dr. Amna because she will not be able to see your questions as she presents. So I will be uh, asking uh, these questions towards the end. Again, we're gonna be doing 45 minutes and then we'll dedicate uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer all of your questions. For today's session, uh, we, yes, I'm starting to get some questions about the recording. So yes, the, ses the session will be recorded and the recording will be shared with you uh, after we're done within the next 24 hours. For today's session, we wanted to do something different when it comes to men's health. We didn't want to focus on just one thing. We didn't want to focus on um, uh, prostate cancer. We didn't just want to focus on heart health. We wanted to cover all the common risks that we see that impacts men's health, whether it's heart health, uh, different types of cancers, diabetes, and even mental health. And uh, for today, I'm very happy to have with me Dr. Amna Bhatt, who's consultant family medicine, and she joined, uh, she joins us from Zia Medical Center. She is a member of the UK Royal College of General Practitioners and the British Medical Association. Dr. Amna, so happy to have you with us today and over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a total pleasure of mine to be here and discuss an important topic like men's health awareness. I think we focus so much on various other topics in life that we actually forget that this is an also an imperative topic that we cover. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I will welcome some questions at the end. So a bit of background that I'm consultant family medicine in uh, qualified from the UK and I have a, a variety of conditions that I cover and I'm more than happy to arrange well-known checkups for you uh, and uh, deal with other minor problems as well as listed above. So we try to work out Generally, if you ask yourself today, how are you feeling? You know, such a simple question. It's always answered to say, okay, but if you really look into it a bit more deeper, how actually are you feeling? What are your symptoms? Um, and as for men, we tend to just, you know, trying to brush it all, but you don't really like to discuss what's going on. So we need to scratch the surface and work out what's going on beneath. So these are some of the statistics that we have collected. Uh, to show what's happening, uh, what kind of conditions that you might come across. Um, we know that an over uh, average of you know, men uh, are living, th their life expectancy is shorter than women, at least by five years. Approximately one in men tend to develop prostate cancer. 29% of men may suffer with a condition called depression which we'll touch upon a bit more detail lately. And men tend to have a higher death uh, rates actually, and then that can be attributed to underlying conditions like heart disease, diabetes, or undiagnosed cancer. So one in uh, five men we know tend to die less than the age of 60. Now that result, to be honest, it was a bit shocking to me when I was looking at uh, research as well, because it's something, you know, we expect from the age of 60 things to develop, but if you're younger and that is happening, we need to identify your risk factors and try and prevent for you. 
and we as you well know yourself you don't make half as many you might want to see a clinician about your condition even where there is a preventative checkup i tend to see a lot more women because of concern in comparison to what men do so what is you know what is the reason behind this we need to understand as clinicians as well why do men don't seek adequate help is it because that they don't realize that it's important to them there is lack of awareness about the health issues around the men men don't like to discuss how they're feeling they don't they find it a bit of a taboo subject especially when it comes around to mental health you know they're, they're these big strong people yes i can do what i want and i can but you know feel free to open up, come and speak to your family doctor, because it's all private. You know, we're all going to keep everything, whatever is discussed within that clinical room, and we won't, uh, there's no one else that needs to know about it. But do open up, because there's a lot of help available these days. There is a little bit of reluctance around the fact that you might want to go and um, uh, take help. And, I mean, there's a lot of stigma around mental health, I find, especially, Post COVID, this condition has risen significantly. But do we actually talk about it enough uh, with our friends, even and family, so that we can get the adequate help? And the lastly, of course, you know, it's about you think is masculinity defined by invincibility? I'll leave that one for you to think about, and maybe how you can reflect on that. So November, this is the time I love this month because it's about raising awareness. It's about understanding the importance of detection of various conditions. Come and book a well-known checkup. Come and discuss, let, let's see what your risk factors are. Do you have anything in your blood disorder, in your history or your genetic makeup that we can find out early so that we can prevent certain conditions? And I would really encourage you to discuss this with your family and friends. And, you know, you would egg each other on to come and talk to your doctor about this as well. So what are the big conditions that affect the men? Number one is one of the most important conditions throughout the world, which is called cardiovascular disease. Number two being diabetes. Number three, cancer. Number four, mental health. Number five, reproductive health. So let's touch upon these and see what we can find important. As you're aware, heart is a, one of the most important organs in the body. So how does it function? What does it do for us? And it's described as a pump, basically. So it's built out of muscles and it's there constantly pumping blood around the body. These are some figures, as you will see, as you when you're a baby and just being born up to 11 months, your heart rate is very fast, so you can see on young children, if you put your hand on the chest wall, the heart rate is very fast indeed. And that, that is because they have a lot of demand and it's constant circulation. But as we get older, the heart rate, the acceptable heart rate tends to settle down. And then up to a certain degree, if you're finding yourself, the athletes amongst yourself will notice, especially when you're watching your heart rate or you're on the treadmill or on the Fitbit, you'll see that the, the resting pulse rate is quite low, which is a sign of actually good health because you want your resting pulse rate to be about 60 and below two, so that your heart is not having to work any harder than it should. Heart disease itself is described as the number one killer worldwide, and it's equivalent to about 31% of deaths globally. We also know from the data overall in the Gulf region UAE, it's approximately responsible for 36% of all deaths. So that's quite a starking figure if you look at it. These figures are real and we really, really need to take action sooner so we can lower these numbers. What are the symptoms of heart disease? One being the main thing is about chest pain. Do you ever find that, you know, chest pain can be a number of presentations is it like a sharp pain is it can it is a shooting pain do you feel like a heaviness in the chest predominantly most likely cardiac symptoms are usually left-sided chest pain but um it's important to note sometimes you can get cardiac pain on the right side as well so come and see the doctor come and get an 
ECG done so I can um, advise what to do next. So this pain, if it radiates, if it moves into the arm, or especially your left side, or it radiates to the neck, if you get short of breath easily, or it's associated with like sweating and nausea, nausea meaning a lot of sickness with it. This is a classic symptom of heart pain, or if you're having an angina, but sometimes you get atypical where you don't get all the symptoms, you might only just get one of them. So still, um, it's important to investigate further. So how do we fight the heart disease? What can we do? You know, it's very well you come and see the doctor, they might prescribe a medication, but what can you do to prevent these conditions? So it's important to realize food is a big, has a big impact on our life. So what are we eating? Have a look in a day. How do you manage and structure your day? When you wake up from breakfast, what do you have for lunch? And then what do you have for dinner? How many portions of fruit and vegetables do you have? And that is key because our vegetables, create, uh, um, they contain a lot of antioxidants. And these antioxidants are important for the blood vessels to have healthy blood flow and reduce the risk of heart attack, especially your green leafy vegetables, the ones that we don't like, like broccoli and kale, the spinach. So we do need to take all these in adequate amounts. So this is a breakdown of what kind of things that are important for our bodies and where we might find these various substances. Carbohydrates are usually found in starchy foods like your oats, your rice, the potatoes as well. So in the morning, if somebody has a, um, a porridge or they have a bowl of oatmeal, that is classed as healthy because that is slowly releasing the carbs and giving you energy. We want to eat the healthy fats. So we've got the unhealthy fats. So like if you're going for a McDonald's or you're going for a burger, that contains a lot of unhealthy fats. But there are healthy fats as well that you need for the body, which are found predominantly in avocados, nuts, certain form of cheese and oils. So you need a balanced diet from protein, where you can easily find in your meats that you like, you know, whether it's a small amount of red meat, your white meat, your eggs have a lot of uh, protein as well. But remember, all this needs to be in balance, nothing too excessive. So if you want to, you don't want too much of protein because even that is harmful. You want to find a nice balance. So having your citrus fruits and your vegetables, the minerals can easily be found in your vegetables, especially the green leafy vegetables are important. And one of the most important staple foods you will find free of charge is water. So having plenty of water gives you hydration. It removes the toxins in the body, which is very important. So what are the phytonutrients? You know, there is a lot of buzz going out there. Oh, well, you need to eat adequate amount of phytonutrients. It's only a, a fancy term for these kind of adequate uh, nutritional values. So we have done a study and it shows that 74% of people don't eat enough of red foods. What is the importance of these red foods? As you can see, red food, you know, uh, a lot of berries like the cherries and the raspberries or your pomegranates. And these uh, pre uh, prevent, you know, they reduce your risk of prostate problems. Uh, so it's important to eat that in adequate amounts. 76% don't eat enough of the purple stroke, the blue foods, so you like your blueberries, your eggplants, blackberries, and these are adequate because these have a lot of antioxidants. So they're very important for your heart and your brain function and, and reducing the risk of cancer. 69% don't eat enough greens. So um, there's a lot more people now going towards like this keto diet. So, you know, we, we encourage eating a lot more salad. So anything green has got an abundance of nutrients in it. And it's very healthy for your liver to help with wound healing and overall your body function as well. We always forget about the white food. We don't really find it very important, but it comes with its uh, benefits. You know, you're having, you're bringing calcium in like your cauliflowers, your garlic, you know, they're very good for your heart and circulation. And the orange fruits, again, they bring a lot of health to your immunity. They're very good. You know, you've heard of vitamin C being important, which is found in like oranges and your lemons, which can be helped to find uh, fight infections and keep your immune uh, systems. So try and mix and match what do you, food uh, and foods you like, and at least two from each uh, color group is good. 
So what is diabetes? I mean, it's again on the increase. It is the, the reason why we're concerned about it because it's got a lot of burden on the health. A high blood sugar will cause not only just damage to your liver, it can cause problem with the pancreas, it can cause problem with the heart, it can cause problem with the eyes because it affects a lot of organs in the body. So we really want to prevent diabetes if possible. And all what diabetes is, over time, there's an increase of your blood sugar and that your body finds it hard to metabolize and it then goes in uh, localizing various organs and causing damage there. So how does it break down, you know, the, the, the sugar that we eat and how then diabetes develop itself? So usually the rising blood glucose will promote what level, what pancreas can do, it produces a hormone called insulin. The main system it starts from the top, so we eat a lot of uh, the sugary foods will go inside your digestive tract, uh, and it's broken down into glucose, and which then enters your bloodstream, uh, and then it triggers your um, pancreas to release the insulin. The main job is by the insulin control, but if you have diabetes, that is defective. There is your pancreas isn't producing sufficient amount of insulin, or you have insulin resistance then you have more chance of this, uh, the blood sugar spiking, which will cause damage to the lining of your blood vessels, your heart, your digestive tract. So what are the types of diabetes you might come across? Type one diabetes is known as the immune system disorder. And it's, it's not a common disorder, it's usually seen at the, in the younger population. So a teenager might be developed to diabetes. So if you have a family history of type 1 diabetes, then it's important to realize to screen the children because they are, again, at high risk of developing this condition. And it's mainly where the immune system attacks your, you know, your whole body inside and you're unable to make the insulin required. Therefore, you, the treating this is where you require insulin injections at an early age. Type 2 diabetes is the most common type of diabetes that is picked up and usually see when we're a bit older. So usually maybe around there any time after four, say, I have seen around 35 years now, I'm seeing younger and younger, but, and that is due to the increased rate of obesity that we see throughout the world. And that has an impact. So we're seeing around diabetes developing, and that is because of the insulin resistance due to the weight, excessive weight, or the kind of foods that we eat, a lot of starchy or carbohydrate foods, we develop a condition called insulin resistance. So the pancreas then not only, it's not just stop producing, it's just not using the insulin effectively. Therefore, the main treatments might include certain type of medications like metformin or certain tablets to help reduce. But the one main thing, unlike type one diabetes where you are on meds for lifelong, if you change the diet, that is a big impact in reducing your overall risk. The gestational diabetes, that is usually seen in pregnancy. So if women are, are higher risk in terms of if they've got uh, already a previous history of gestational diabetes or this family history, or they are overweight, then again, that would increase the risk of developing diabetes during pregnancy. So it's important to see the doctor to get yourself screened to make sure your bloods are all stable. And my more important condition that I like to focus on is usually pre-diabetes because that is your precursor. It's like your body giving you a warning. Hey, I've not got diabetes just yet, but if I don't do something about it now, I will develop diabetes. So you have to work on it sooner rather than later. If you can prevent it, it's much better rather than not take the nasty medications. So what are the signs? What do we experience once you do develop certain types of diabetes? One of the most commonest one is going to the toilet a lot. You want to, you might go to pass urine and then you feel after an hour, oh, I need to go again. So frequent urination is a prominent sign. Increased thirst, where you feel constantly. I mean, I know in the summer months we like to drink a lot of water, but this is abnormal thirst that, you know, you're always constantly drinking uh, without even the need to actually drink water. Feeling hungry a lot. You feel very tired, lethargic, quite weakness will settle in. Some people get weight loss and some people will put weight on, uh, increase the number of weights as well. 
so um, you can I diagnose with weight loss as well. There's blurred vision, so we can we can't see. There's high sugar that affects your eyes, which is why we want to detect it early and do an annual screening of your eyes, getting your opticians to check there's no damage at the back of the eye. Feeling sick, and sometimes these kind of either cuts or bruises or tingling, which are like you know pins and needles that you might notice on your tips of a finger or feet. Now moving on to a topic about cancer. So cancer is a disease of the cells of the body. So you might find, you know, normally, as you can see the diagram, a cell will divide normally and will produce healthy cells. If for a reason that there is a mutation in your genetic makeup and you produce an abnormal cell, which is damage, which then divides, then you will get cancer cell division, which leads to the production of cancer. So normally there's an it becomes out of control. So if you get an abnormality, that could multiply many times uh, and the cascade will get out of hand. So what are the types of cancer that we notice in men and we like to pick up early? As you can see, there's a number of areas that can affect from head to toe, basically. So starting off with the head, usually head and neck cancer. If you are a smoker or you chew tobacco, those people are very high risk of developing head and neck cancers. There's a lot of carcinogens uh, associated with chewing tobacco or even things like shisha and hookah, you know, those kind of things, because it's high dose concentration and it's quite local. The central nervous system, you can develop brain tumours, you can develop uh, tumours of the eye. Then the endocrine, which is uh, the system mainly you might come across a condition called thyroid cancer, that is uh, not so common as well. Then a blood disorder called leukaemia. And that could be hereditary. So there is a family history. So it's important to get that screened early. And something called Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. Again, if there's a family history, you could easily pick that up quite soon by doing various screening programs. The gastrointestinal finding colorectal cancer, which affects the large intestines of the body. Uh, and also whether stomach cancer can develop as well. Skin is known as the largest organ of the body because it's constantly exposed and you can develop a condition called malignant melanoma, which is a very dangerous type of skin cancer. You have other types of skin cancer as well, like uh, known as the squamous cell cancer or the basal cell. And again, that is why we say you need to protect your skin when you're out in the sun, put UV factor 50 on, put sun protection on so you're protecting the skin, uh, reducing the amount of radiation. Sarcoma is known as the bone, uh, basically, of the, either the bones the, or the soft tissue cancer. Geni of affecting the urinary tract, the main one in the men you will come across is the prostate cancer, the testicular cancer, or the bladder cancers. In the liver, it can affect pancreatic, liver, and biliary cancers. And finally, the lungs, they can, uh, again, which is a direct association with family history and smoking, or previously, if you've been exposed to asbestos as well, that is also a direct link to lung cancer. So, a bit about the prostate cancer. It is the third leading cause of death in the UAE, approximately about 16% of overall deaths is attributed to prostate cancer. It's the second leading cause of the, in men and the most common cause uh, is actually lung cancer. It accounts for about 40% of all cancers in men. One in nine men may be diagnosed with prostate cancer during their lifetime. And approximately one in 39 men might die from this condition. So most of them of this condition is usually picked up. You might not have a family history. So, even, so it's important to have these kind of screenings to pick this up early. So what is the prostate gland itself? What is it responsible? It's the male hormone. It is the male gland found uh, just around where the urethral cover is. It's small, like a bulb that we call it. And it's when the prostate, with time, as you get older, after the age of 45 or even fit around the age of 50, generally due to age, this prostate gland tends to enlarge. And it's, you can have a condition called BPH, which is called benign prostatic hypertrophy. And that is a normal phenomenon happening due to age. 
and that can cause compression of the urethra, which is responsible for passing urine. And you might notice symptoms of like frequency of urine or difficulty in passing urine, especially when you get older. And that could be a sign of this prostate condition. And this is different to the prostate cancer because this condition is not cancerous, it's benign, but still investigating and finding it early helps. So what are the risk factors for developing prostate cancer itself? Firstly, and it's an aging process. We don't tend to see it in the youngsters, luckily. So as if you're going a bit older, around the age of 50, the mean age, you, uh, that, that has an attribute factor. Some genetic, whether, whether you've got the genes, or whether it's been passed on to the family history as well. Diet, diet plays a lot of big role in a lot of conditions, whether it's a metabolic or cancerous. So eating a high like meat diet in the future can affect, especially red meat, has got a lot of downside it is related to increased risk of cancer. Being unhealthy, like if you're overweight or in particularly with a BMI of over 30, that is classed as obesity, uh, that increases your risk. There is a direct correlation with smoking, so whether it's cigarettes or it's shisha as well, that also relates to carcinogens and causing these problems. It's been noticed that ethnicity is more common in the African-American group. Uh, uh, there's been some studies done that shows more common in these uh, big groups. Heavy alcohol drinking. So, you know, you, some people are social drinkers, which is acceptable, but if you drink too many units, that is why it's important to monitor how much units you have in the week so that uh, it reduces your risk. And not really, you know, uh, like, you know, exposure to UV, like, you know, radiation, as we, you know, we do a lot of these kind of images, these kind of things are also. Um, uh, important to realize it has an impact on developing cancer. Not having adequate amount of vitamin D. So, you know, it's, there's been a lot of buzz about vitamin D throughout COVID that we need to make sure our vitamin D levels are important for this reason. And having too much testosterone. So that's why, you know, I'm not a big fan of people sometimes taking endogenous form of testosterone because it can be linked to these kind of prosthetic issues. And low sex hormone gliding goblin, which is known, which is a risk for prostate cancer as well. And that is easily tested. There's a blood test that you can do, and you can check your level of SHBG, which is a hormone in the uh, bloodstream, and we can identify that for you. So, what are the symptoms that you might notice in relation to prostate cancer? So, frequency of urination. So, again, more often than normal. If your flow is interrupted, so normally when you go to pass urine, it should be a stream, which is quite normal, single stream. But if it stops, starts, stops, starts, then that is interruption. It's, there is a hesitancy that, you know, when you have to wait for a little bit to, before you start urinating. Or there's an urge at night, especially, that you can't control, say, oh, I, I might not make it to the toilet, or you might have small accidents where you have incontinence. That, again, could be a sign where the prostate is enlarged and it wants to. Uh, give you a sign to go and visit your doctor. Sometimes you might notice blood in the urine or semen. So that is, again, abnormal. You need to get that investigated. There could be back pain. There could be pain on urinating itself. Or sometimes when you're sitting, because in the sitting position, the prostate gland has a lot of contact with your seat. So that is why there's a lot of pressure. So abnormal amount of pain. So get that checked as well. So what, how can we actually reduce your risk of developing uh, cancer? We always find out what the symptoms are, so what can we do now to make the changes? So drinking, healthy nutrition is key. Eating a good uh, balanced diet, so having adequate amount of your dairy, your eggs, your carbohydrates, but nothing in excess amounts, and your uh, fruits and vegetables as well. Physical exercise is key. You want to make sure you get at least between 30 to 40 minutes a day if you can do, or you can do more uh, during a short amount during the weekend, but high intensity kind of exercise. If you, due to long work hours, if you struggle to get to a gym, but maybe just running by the beach, you know, for long hours, that would be quite adequate as well. Staying hydrated. So it's very important to drink a lot of water throughout the day. So that is your circulation is maintained. 
reducing your toxin burden as well. So, you know, the harmful toxic substances that we might use. Maintaining a healthy BMI, BMI meaning your body mass index, or looking at your weight and your height, is that adequate? Making sure that you're not overweight in any way. Managing your stress levels. I appreciate everyone is watching this at work. So yeah, it is a very stressful environment, but you need to know when to take your breaks, making sure you do something that reduces the stress in your life. Taking adequate amount of vitamin D is important. Try and reduce smoking, really try and work hard, reducing your smoking and eventually quitting at some point, that would be ideal. And most importantly, regular screenings because we want to prevent it. If you're at risk, come and speak to your doctor, come and speak to me, we can always organize health checks. These screening programs are there to help pick up things early. So what are the possible screenings that we have uh, in place? We've got blood tests, quite simple really, that you can do. It's known as the PSA, the prostate specific antigen. There's a total and free level that we can check. There's genetic kind of screenings that they can be offered. Uh, and a hormone profile as well. So come and discuss, we can arrange that. Or further investigations like is doing some form of examination, a, a rectal examination um, to pick up. So sometimes the urologist check with the fingers if the prostate is enlarged, are there any abnormal nodules? Or we may well send you for an ultrasound and, and that gives a direct idea how any big the size of your prostate is. Are there any abnormalities? If that's positive, then you may well need to send you for an MRI scan. If there is any suggestion of abnormality, we can arrange a biopsy, which is taking us, uh, we insert a needle into the gland and we take a biopsy of the tissue. That is then sent to the laboratory and it gives us an idea of what condition is it that you're suffering from. So, what is the survival rate? It's very important. Uh, that you realize in, with this particular cancer, if it's picked up early, the survival rates are exceptionally high. That is why I really urge about screening for this condition uh, earlier around the age group is important. Because if you're at stage zero and one, you've got a 100% survival rate, which is amazing. Stage two, even, it's got a 95% rate. A lot of the other cancers, like with Balvin, if you get to stage two and three, you're percentage rate considerably reduces down to 40, 50. So picking up prostate cancer is important because we can help and plan treatments and get it, uh, get it sorted. And unfortunately, stage four is will be related to only 35% of the survival rate. So now talking about stress, what does stress do? Remember, it's got a lot of you know, physical implementations in your body. So it can affect the brain and your nerves by, you know, your trouble concentrating. It can have difficulty sleeping. You can develop conditions like anxiety, panic attacks. It can affect the heart by uh, causing palpitations, making your heart beat faster uh, and increasing the risk of developing heart attack. Affects the stomach by uh, causing nausea, heartburn, sometimes you know, a lot of indigestion is due to stress because constant acid production uh, it causes these kinds of stress ulcers. So it's important to manage that. With, it can affect the pancreas by causing increased risk of diabetes. Indigestion affects by causing a condition like constipation or diarrhea, like IBS symptoms as well. These are direct linked to stress. And also reproductive program, like women uh, can get um, painful periods. For men, you can develop a condition called impotence and low sperm production. So that will affect like, you know, your fertility, whether you have children and your low overall uh, what your sexual desire. So a beautiful slide, it really sums it up well. Healthier men tend to live happier with longer life. So take action now, work, look at your health, give it some importance. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you uh, for listening to me and having me for this afternoon. And now I would like to welcome some questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Amna. I thoroughly enjoyed the session and actually I've been getting feedback throughout that um, uh, many of our attendees have found it valuable. So I thank you for the wealth of information you have provided. 
we do have a good deal of questions and not a whole bunch of time to answer them. So we have the next seven minutes so we can take a few questions. Um, I got some queries on the recording and the slides. So uh, yes, we will be sharing the recording with you uh, by tomorrow and uh, in including the slides. Um, we have maybe a dozen questions that are related to uh, the, the nutrition and sure. diet, surprisingly. So I will go more maybe into the more specifics, the more specific ones, and then maybe we can cover the we can cover it in a more broad manner as a summary for the session. So, um, let's see the first one. What is a good amount of red meat, for example, one time a week or two times a week? Right. So it's what your body requirements are. I've heard you say maybe once a week, maximum twice, but usually once a week is sufficient. You should try and portion it out. So. It's not eating too much in one, in one go as well, because red meat has a lot of, if you eat too much of that, you can, your uric acid will rise and can give you a condition called gout, uh, which has an impact as well. So just having that kind of one, once or twice a week, some people really like their meat, you know, you feel like, oh, I you know, want to have that regularly. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend it more than once a week if possible. But it, uh, supplement if there's white meat one day, a fish that has a lot of omega-3, or some days is just a pure like vegetable day as well. So mix and match. Mm -hmm. uh, another question came in. I'm on keto diet and I'm losing weight, but is it a sustainable diet? My diet is effectively 75% fat, 20% protein and 5% carbs. Yeah. Keto diet has shown a lot of, there's a lot of data to support with quite a uh, quick kind of weight loss. So people who want to lose weight quickly, will do like a keto diet and it, it is very much dependent on reducing the carbs. But when you stop the keto diet, you know, then you tend to put that kind of weight back on again if, and if you have a rebound effect. So it's about disciplining yourself just generally every day as well. How much carbs am I going to have? Because eating the carbohydrates increase spikes the blood sugar and makes you very uh, develop uh, insulin resistance as well. Yes, so people have a concern on the keto diet. I eat a lot of fat, so you know, having the health, having healthy fats is important because you will, we will do a blood test where we will check your cholesterol level. So that is why on a keto diet, it's important to look at what your lipid profile is. What is your total cholesterol, and then what is your further LDL, which is known as your bad cholesterol, and HDL, which is known as your good cholesterol. And according to that, then your doctor can manage what you need to do. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of tailoring, that is that is the slight downside of keto diet because yes, you're relying a lot more on fats, but then at some point you can then supplement it more with like fruits and vegetables as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe another question, moving to a little bit uh, in a different section. So, what could be the reason of inability to control urination if it's not due to diabetes? What shall be done for diagnosis? poor condition to rule out. You want to check your urine analysis and culture to make sure there's no simple thing like infection. So frequency can occur due to that. Or a condition called benign prostatic hypertrophy. So where your prostate might be enlarged. And, and that is usually if you're a bit older, 45 plus 50, and you will notice a lot of frequency. If you're younger, so the younger age group around the 20s and the 30s, you might have a condition called irritable bladder where you're like you might just drink a lot of water and it's very sensitive and it makes you want to go to pass urine again so again you need to discuss if you have irritable bladder uh, the, the studies that can be done to check how dynamic studies we call them um, and how well it's functioning there are simple treatments the small tablets that can be given to control the the muscles of your uh, urinary bladder to reduce the amount of time you pass urine Is there any direct relation between testicular cancer and prostate cancer? Any cancer can have a link where you will, uh, if you develop one cancer, you might be at risk of developing the other as well. But usually they are seen separately because for, I've seen testicular cancer develop in the middle age group, while the um, uh, prostatic cancer tends to be in the older age group. 
So the testicular cancer, you tend to start screening from the age of 30, 35, uh, as you, it's a, it, it can be a peak at that time. And again, with the older age group, anything after 45 plus, you need to be looking on a yearly basis, checking your PSA level. But there can be a link if you've got a very high risk, if there's a strong family history, and if there's been a gene mutation. So your doctor will make that judgment. Okay, and um, we have maybe another few questions on prostate cancer. So I'm going to maybe bundle a couple of them together uh, sure. because we have to cover as many questions as we can. So can we survive after removal of prostate cancer in an early stage? So I think we covered that along the four stages. And how's life after removing it when it comes to day-to-day -day activity? Perfect, yes. It's got a very good um, outlook on life. People get back to normality for what it is to them. I've come across sometimes after surgery, people come complaining of some symptoms like uh, they might have problems with ejaculation, or you know, they, or you know, they, they find it's hard to sustain the ejaculation. Then there are tablets at that point where we can help. Uh, but it depends on what type of um, cancer it was and what treatment you've had. So if you've had a lot of radiotherapy uh, to that area then they, you might develop that complication. Otherwise, if it was quite straightforward where it was just capsulated and they removed it out without much damage to the pelvic area, then the outlook is brilliant. You know, you could be going back to the gym, you're enjoying a healthy lifestyle, you're running. Um, you might be left with a bit of numbness. I've noticed another symptom that people tend to say, that there is reduced sensation. And that, for some people, comes back over a period of a number of months because the nerves are taking their time to regenerate. Um, for some very small proportion, maybe it might not come back, but it, you're not really left with any long term sequence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Doctor. We have actually a few uh, questions that are related to like very specific medical conditions. So, uh, in this case, I would recommend that you can either uh, reach out to uh, Dr. Anna directly in the medical center or to reach out to your own doctor for like particular or specific advice. Um, how frequent do we need to see the doctor for regular checkup? Sure. So as part of any screening, any concern, a health check should be done on a yearly basis as a baseline, just to see if things are. And the reason for that is because you will see a pattern. So already, if you're having changes in your cholesterol or anything that we can pick that up. But once you have that health check and then abnormalities are identified, in particular, I see a lot of, especially since COVID has happened and there was lockdown, people were staying at home, they couldn't exercise. So a lot of people's cholesterol was rising. And if you see a significantly high, so we will do as risk stratification. If there's high risk, then I would recommend rechecking at level three month and six month. Not to do the full health check again, but at least for blood, that particular profile of bloods. But for a baseline, an annual health check is important. Thank you, Doctor. I think we have room for one more question because we're already two minutes over time. So, is it okay for vegetarians to take whey protein supplements to balance protein intake? Yes, that's something it's, I've heard quite a lot of people do uh, to take, you know, just to balance, uh, balance it out. As long as you're taking your adequate vitamins as well, remember vegetarians will be deficient. Uh, uh, you know, because the meat, you get a lot of like B12 or your um, folic, folic acid as well. But if you're taking supplements uh, as well, then you should balance out what the effect of whey protein does as well. But again, in moderation, because you want to make sure that it has no impact on overall. So when you do like a health check, we do a body composition analysis as part of it, and it gives you how much lean mass you have, how much muscular or fat there is. And that gives you a nice idea how to then balance your diet and what you should be doing. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Amna, and thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, again, I want to um, thank everyone who was part of this session. This is our last webinar for the year 2021, and we're looking forward to launching a new series of MetLife webinars in 2022. So uh, please keep an eye out for the invites for those. Um, thanks again. Have a pleasant afternoon, and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.